The Holy Gospel according to St. John. I'm not sure who's upstairs, if it is Sarah or, well, I don't really know. It's, that looks like Shannon. I can't tell. They're all short. But I'm going to start at verse number 11. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Here's the strange turn. Here's what is illogical. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. 
I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. From before Lent, I saw what they put up on the altar. I know, and you know, that it is a prop to help us understand and navigate the story of the transfiguration. But it remained with us. It remained because I asked for it to be present throughout Lent. And each of the sermons you have heard, somehow in it was embedded sometimes a lengthy narrative, other times just a few words to remind you to pay attention to that prop. To ask yourself whatever you want to ask yourself about it. Throughout this season of Lent, a small group has taken place. 30 people attended throughout its three sessions. Death, dying, and bereavement. I was shocked that we had that many attend. Death is not a subject that people generally want to learn about. Dying is not something we want to talk about. And bereavement, well, that's a word we're not even sure what it is. But 30 people, bread, bowl, and Bible, 29 volunteers working seamlessly together. Someone said when I mentioned last week, you were a class act. They mentioned you might want to caution saying that because it could appear that we are arrogant. Class act you are without the arrogance class act you took the extra step you were willing to go to the top of the mountain you were willing to reveal to those who were our guests that we take seriously the gifts that God has given us to be shared with others well done today it's Oliver and Emily next week it might be Chris on the organ and Maddie, a variety of people doing what they can to lead us in singing and worship. Death, where is thy sting? I pray not here, yet the truth is we are surrounded by death. Read the texts again when you get home. We are surrounded by death. Our minds are filled with valleys of bones. We've come through and seemingly coming out the other side of a global pandemic. It doesn't take much. We ourselves are close to death. COVID-19. Uvalde, Texas, Memphis, Tennessee, Ukraine, Boulder, Colorado, Buffalo, New York, Florida, Highland Park, Illinois, gun violence, Washington, D.C., the fate of democracy. 
it doesn't take much to hear the law. We are surrounded by dry bones. Veterans come home with unspeakable nightmares. Not only human beings are dying, but our planet, too, is dying. Our minds are filled with dry bones. Ones for whom we have love are sick and dying. Parents have dementia. Some become nicer. Some become unusually violent. Dry bones. Death stalks us at every corner. We are sick. We are a dying people. And in our minds, our failures, our guilt, our shame haunt us, tracking us down and winning the fight. What is one to do in the face of such agony and pain? Dried bones. We don't even say they died. We, even the church, say they passed. They're in a better place. We hide death. We run from it. We profoundly fear it. Death, dying, bereavement. We make decisions. We make bad decisions. Our possessions won't help us live longer. Our passions won't soothe us. We make bad choices, believing that our fears will be numbed. We choose bad leaders because we falsely believe that they will protect us. Our fear leads us to sin. God, we are so afraid we can't even acknowledge it to you. Church. We say it in our creeds. We say it in our prayers. It's in the communion. You are a new creation. Tell us the story, Jesus. Help your church show up and be honest. Our services rehearse being truth tellers. Our services Today, reveal these particular texts from Ezekiel and the fourth gospel, John. They reveal for us not the law, but the gospel. It's the Easter story, and it runs to us. The stories today want us to hold on and grip them. This lesson today, these lessons today, look at them. He said to me, mortal, can these bones live? Haven't you been around people that have no more hope? Who are afraid that their loved ones will die? Afraid they might even take their own life. Have you been there? I answered, oh Lord God, you know. Can these dry bones live? Beautiful lessons that help us to tell the truth, to lead us to life, to set us free, to make us witness bearers, to make every Sunday an Easter Sunday, every day a resurrection day. These texts today liberate us. They break the bonds. They shake free. If we allow it, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off completely. Too many think that's the case. But Lord, you know, yes, these mortal bones can live again. They can come together again. 
they can be whole, healed bodies. Our bones, where have you laid them, Jesus says in the gospel. Where have you laid him? Where have you laid your loved ones? Where have you laid this church? Where have you laid the gospel message? Where is it? Take it out. Dust it off. Read it. Consume it. Live it. Breathe it. And die with it. Die with Jesus so that you can be lived, alive, new creations again. Lord, you do know our death with your death. Death stinks. Our dry bones, where have you lead that, laid, laid them? And what do you do when you hear of that, Lord? You weep. The resurrection weeps. The Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, the King of kings weeps when he sees dry bones. He weeps with us. He weeps with you. Gospel. Jesus Christ destroys death. Jesus orders the stone to be removed. He gives thanks to the Father for hearing his prayer. And he commands Lazarus, emerge, come out. Do you see it? Neither Lazarus or anyone else present believed in Jesus' power. None of them. Not one. Just the opposite is the case. This story shows us the crowd did not expect a dead man to, to emerge when the stone was rolled away. The people assume that death is final, that it's irrevocable, and that there's no remedy for it. That's what they assume. Yet the story tells us in this gospel, this 11th chapter, that the crowd didn't have to believe. If you've been taught it's by your faith that you are healed. If you've been taught you didn't have enough faith and that's why you weren't healed. If you've been taught that it is wrong, says the Lord. It is wrong. Human belief is not the source of the rising. Not one ounce. It is Jesus' oneness with God the Father that creates and is the source of this resurrection. Jesus creates the ability for all of us to rise again. For all of us to be no longer dry bones, but to be the body, one body, working together, not against each other, not ignoring counsel, not ignoring truth, being truth tellers, truth seekers, being honest. That's when the healing comes. That's when the bones come together. That's when people live. Mortal, can these dry bones live? And God's answer, because God does know, the answer is yes. Dry bones, new creation. New life, the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God.